Good morning, afternoon, evening. We're just getting uh, gathered here. We'll start in a few minutes. I should have recruited Chaz to play his uh, guitar as introduction music. It's a big hit last webinar or last event. As a reminder, the session is being recorded. Welcome everyone. Hi. I see some of the usual suspects. <laughs> there you go. That's always usual good to see. faces. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> hello, hello. Yeah, I don't have music, but I do have a dog. So um, hopefully he's pretty quiet during the presentation. His name is Gartner, just enough proof of oh, how ner nerdy, nerdy <laughs> I am over here. Oh, that's <laughs> great. Um, yeah, I came back from a Gartner conference and there was a new addition to the family, so. Stay down. Yeah, I have a dog in the background as well. He, um, you know, he's got a, a cone of shame, so he's um, trying to scratch it and stuff. So yeah, he might be making noise too. The work from home, you know, casualty, right? I sent mine to doggy daycare yesterday, so she'll be sleeping for the entire 24 hour period following. That's brilliant. Yes. Well, well planned. Yeah. Yeah. If UPS comes to my house, you will all meet my dog. <laughs> it's an eager greeter of the UPS drivers. Welcome, everyone. Just uh, letting people in as I noticed. Uh, the entry rate starts to slow down, then we'll start. Um, but for now, I'm just uh, admitting people. This session is being recorded, by the way, and will be available uh, later on in, on the ITSM website. Go ahead and share the title slide so someone have so we have something to look at. Testing the Slide deck here, meeting everyone still. Uh, Chaz has just joined us. Welcome, Mary. We're just talking about your uh, musical prowess. Looks like we're going to have a full house, everyone. We're looking at about 76 people right now. Why don't we give ourselves uh, just a minute or two? Uh, seems like it's slowing down, letting people in. Uh, well, I'm going to go ahead and start. If you see people joining, would you um, let them in for me or let for us? All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking some time out today to uh, join this event, Challenges of the CMDB uh, Practice and Implementation. So today we're going to um, follow the following format. Uh, we're going to have a series of questions to ask our, ask our guests today. Um, and after each guest has had a chance to answer the question. Uh, we'll move on to other guests that may want to chime in. And then after each question, we'll also allow our um, attendees, you all, to join in in asking questions 
And we'll also allow time at the end, uh, give ourselves about 10 minutes before the end of the hour to um, go back and ask any questions that maybe were missed. Um, this session is being recorded. We will post it on the IT Service Management website within five business days. Um, everyone will be on mute, but um, please, you know, either use the chat feature to ask questions or um, you can take yourself on mute, off of mute to ask your question. Uh, but we ask that when you're done asking a question, please put yourself back on mute. Um, this is meant to be highly interactive. So we do encourage um, live conversation and uh, questions through chat. Um, so with that said, um, I will now turn it over to Will to introduce our guests and moderate the discussion. Thanks, Mitch. I really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Will Schultz. I'm at Cornell University. I'm an ITSM specialist here. Um, so a lot of the work that I focus on is around sort of the stuff that we already have operational. Um, and you'll hear from my uh, my manager colleague um, and the program manager, Alicia, in just a sec, but um, I, I spend a lot of time, I'm the change manager for our organization, and I try to work with a lot of our stakeholders, uh, excuse me, our technicians to try to really um, help them kind of get the most out of their the, the processes and practices. Um, so I'm going to be sort of moderating, but I'll introduce the rest of our guests here um, today. So. There we go. So we have Bob Black, uh, who's the Assistant Director for IT Process and Planning at Miami University. Um, he has uh, is a certified project management professional and ITIL expert uh, over there. He's been uh, at Miami University for over 20 years um, and now manages a small team uh, dedicated to improving service management there at Miami University. Um, and is an alumnus of the 2009 Educause Institute Leadership Program, um, earned a, a BS in Business Administration, and is, like we said, PMP and ITIL expert. Next up, Alicia Briggs, who is the ITSM Program Manager um, at Cornell. Um, Alicia is a technology management professional with a keen sense for leveraging best practices in technology to support IT departments in delivering quality results. Um, as our program manager, she coordinates implementation of common practices um, with an emphasis on people metrics and the need to right size ITSM for higher ed. Alicia has a bachelor's in technology management and uh, ITIL and Six Sigma certifications um, and uses proven concepts to inform program decisions and applies practical experience from the corporate sector uh, towards service management solutions like ServiceNow, Remedy, and Team Dynamics. We also have Jen Birch with us, a senior IT project manager from the University of Michigan. Um, she also has over 20 years of experience in leading technology products, programs, and product development for companies, federal government, and higher ed. Um, she is a certified PMP and uh, Agile certified practitioner. She's also a certified Scrum product owner and Scrum master with Scrum Alliance, and is a secretary of the Educause PMCG steering committee and uh, recently co-presented at the conference this year. It's awesome. And lastly, we have Lucas Friedrichsen, who is the ITSM product manager for Oregon State University. Um, he's the primary administrator of their Team Dynamics platform uh, and leads a small team of developers focused on integrations with Team Dynamics and maintaining internally developed web apps. His passion is working with stakeholders and colleagues to develop and improve processes and their service management practices. Uh, prior to being the ITSM product manager, he was uh, spent over 15 years in service focused IT technician and management positions and is uh, an alumnus of OSU, Masters of Business Administration, and has ITIL uh, and KCS certifications. So. Thanks to all of our guests um, for being here today and sort of being willing to kick off the conversation around um, the CMDB uh, and you know, asset and service configuration management practices. Um, I thought uh, you know, what, what we would try to do today was kick off some conversations about the 
how to get started and, and sort of some of what the common challenges were with um, implementing these practices. And um, to that end, I thought it would be good if we could maybe have Mitch um, do a little bit of uh, definition for us so that we're all kind of level on a playing field. Um, because when we first reached out about this topic, you know, there's a wide range of folks, um, at different points of, of um, using this practice. So uh, Mitch, can you define service configuration management and asset management for us? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Will, would you mind uh, allowing people in as if they start, uh, more people start trickling in? Um, yeah, so we thought it was a good idea to kind of, um, you know, go through some some basic definitions. So we're level setting and, you know, speaking the same language, right? Um, so, uh, and I will be talking specifically about the ITIL 4. And I do want to say that if you have an ITIL 3, uh, V3 um, asset and, and configuration management pro uh, uh, process implemented and it's working well, we're not suggesting that you change any of that or I'm not suggesting you change any of that. But I will, you know, because we are in two years into, into ITIL 4, I want to start talking more about, you know, if you don't have a practice right now, how do you, you know, start that and how do you move towards doing that? So, um, yeah, so in ITIL 4, we look at two distinct practices emerging from what was service asset configuration management. So they separated asset and configuration management, but they're still both considered to be service management practice. And recall that a practice is made up of a process, but also includes organizational resources to accomplish an objective. So this includes people as well, right? Um, so ITIL 4 defines service configuration management as the purpose of uh, ensuring accurate and reliable information about the configuration of services and that the configuration item that supports them. It's available when and where it's needed. This includes information about how configuration items are configured and the relationship between them. So a key message here is configuration management is about the accurate see of things that make up a service, the specific configuration of those items and the relationship between them. And we're gonna get into a little bit about the necessity to have those relationships built out as part of any um, service configuration management project. So a configuration item, uh, it's pretty much the same as um, ITIL v3. It's uh, expanded maybe a little bit to say it's a component and any component that needs to be managed in order to deliver an IT service. So there are really two focal points here, managed, right? As opposed to an asset. Um, and needed to deliver a service. So configuration, if you look at the word configuration, it is an arrangement of elements in a particular form, figure, or combination. The item is part of the service configuration that makes up the service. So fundamental to the CMDB is the relationship between service components. Um, CMS, configuration management system, often is time is oftentimes is synonymous with configuration management database. If you have multiple configuration management databases, this might make up a configuration management system. I personally wouldn't recommend having multiple CMDBs, but that may be you know, something that's happening in your institution. So um, going on to what asset management is, right? So asset management, a much related or integral practice um, that, that, that leverages or, or you know, is, is um, integrated with um, you know, your configuration management is the practice of planning and managing the life cycle of all, T, all IT assets. So it's IT asset management. So we're not talking about like you know, an, a monitor holder or a chair. These are IT assets to maintain um, or manage controls, to manage risk and, and to maximize value, right? So an, an IT asset is really defined as a financially valuable component that can contribute to the delivery of an IT product or service. So both are important in the overall IT infrastructure, but one IT asset is more about the physicality or physical properties, cost, make, model, location. Um, and there's really two types of assets. You, you have your software assets and you have your infrastructure or device or hardware assets. So the key message here with IT asset management is that assets are not directly managed or part of a service configuration. Uh, as I mentioned, there is tight integration between the objectives of one, but it's not to be synonymous with, with each other, right? And they each have a life cycle that operate um, independent, interdependently from each other. Um, final thought, and then I'll, I'll pass it on to Will, is that getting started with a CMDB, um, there are some excellent models out there, uh, various frameworks and models. Some can be supplied by your vendor if you're a ServiceNow shop. Uh, look at the Common Services Data Model. Um, look at Free Lucy, which is a product um, not owned by ServiceNow, but it can help you start building your dependencies. Um, and then there's you know, TBM and a couple other models out there. 
um, that can help you start to think about how do you structure your um, your configuration management or your, your CIs. So ITIL does not give prescriptive guidance on how to structure your, your, your CMS or which CI attributes should be used or what you should use to map the relationships. However, we hope this conversation today will give you some idea on where to start or where to improve if you're ready to implement one. So I'll hand it back to Will. Awesome, thanks Mitch. Really appreciate that um, and sort of the the fact that you know it's important to think about these two separate categories. I think we'll sort of touch on that, that later on, um, as especially with our with our guests today. You know, some have built things a while ago, so it may be predating uh, thought around you know separating out asset and um, service configuration items in that way. Um, so, so thinking about you know all of the. This is this is a set of practices, and the CMDB is a set of the topic here. Um, I wanted to know what what people might think about as the business needs or drivers behind making a decision to actually implement something like this. Right? We don't actually need it from a like a ticketing perspective, but there are lots of reasons to want to manage um, configuration items and assets. Um, so, sort of curious. And I think I'm going to hand this to Bob first. Um, what, what were some of the business needs and drivers and, and organizational prereqs that sort of helped you uh, get started on this journey? Yeah, um, before we did that real quick, did we have a poll that we wanted to put oh. up about um, just That's getting a, a sense call. of where everyone is? Yeah. All right, let me grab that poll for everyone. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the uh, first poll. We have three polls that will be used today. So I'm going to launch it. Just to let me know if you can see this. I'll give a, you know, 10, 15 seconds to go ahead and make your uh, entry. I'm seeing a trend here, Will. <laughs> I think everyone's come to the right event. We had about 90 people out of 108 responding. Yeah. So, and uh, Mitch, are you able to share the results with the group when this I can. is uh, yeah, closed yeah. out? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, so we're about there. So let me go ahead and uh, end the poll. And let me go ahead and share it. Thanks again for the reminder on that, Bob. So yeah, I mean, this this sort of models the the response that I initially got from a lot of people you know, when we first hit this up on the um, CG message board, um, a lot of people are just sort of thinking about it, right? So great, let's definitely get into the why you would want to do it and how to think about approaching the process. Um, for those of you who answered uh, things like CMDB is robust and kept up to date, and you have your CI types and stuff well defined and changes are tracked, you guys will be the ones that will want to have you add in on the conversation. Um, you know, uh, along with our with our other guests here today. So thank you for being here as well. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the six of you out there that answered that way, you should you should uh, you should be here instead of instead of us. No, I think we, uh, you you've know, been we recruited all, onto the. Panel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no matter where no matter where you are in this journey, um, I think everyone uh, often is surprised to find out they're further along than, than they think they are. Um, yeah, and getting back then, so uh, continuing, I guess, and answering the question that Will started about uh, business needs and drivers, um, I'm sure everyone's gonna uh, throw pie at me when I say, of course, this is gonna vary you know, by every institution. Um, so just speaking for, for ours, you know, it's been a shifting target, right? So one of the, the premises that we've really thought long and hard about when it comes to configuration management and the CMDB is that it's something that we are always um, investing in and improving, no matter what process we're looking at or even service, one of the things we're always thinking about is, is there an element of the CMDB that can, you know, be leveraged here or be made better to, to help overcome whatever hurdle challenge problem we're, we're facing. So um, I guess just a brief history of that for us, you know, of course, like many of you, I think 
we started with ticketing really driving. And, you know, as we uh, put formal investment in our ITSM program starting in about 2014, it was okay, as we do incidents and as we do service requests, we really want to be able to tie these back to the specific configuration items that they're about. And that varied. Um, and so it wasn't just about the physical assets like we were talking about that sit on people's desk, but also, you know, the applications that um, they're using, um, you know, from those devices out to as we, you know, de deployed more and more cloud things, wanting to manage what those cloud things were and making sure we had configuration items in our uh, configuration management system that allowed us to, to trace, hey, people are contacting for help about you know something in the cloud and so on and so forth. And so very much focused from a ticketing perspective. The next thing that happened for us was change management. And we really put in a requirement that, hey, if you're making a change to something, well, that something should be in the configuration management system somewhere. So, um, and in that, I think is where we got a lot of growth in our infrastructure level change. So thinking about servers um, and really trying to have a good uh, understanding of what, you know, what servers were being changed and being able to point to specific servers, not just physical servers, but virtual servers um, as well. And that's where we were really driven to do a lot more automation. And we really started understanding the concept of a single pane. So you've got server management, you know, consoles that are keeping track of the specific information about um, the servers themselves. And we didn't want to necessarily try to replicate that all, right? But we wanted to make it so that, hey, anybody can start at the CMDB level and have an understanding of what the server is and then, you know, tentacle out to the details wherever those authoritative details stand. Um, it's been interesting in the last couple of years, uh, the focus really has shifted to classrooms. So for us, that's been the place that's um, I think we're, we're spending the most time and energy is trying to get a really good handle on what on earth is out there in our learning spaces and what, uh, t you know, what standard of technology as we try to be able to better and better define, um, you know, classroom A has these capabilities and classroom B has these other capabilities. Um, and so, you know, we've pivoted to, to different um, sets of configuration items based on those needs. So I don't know if any of the others, you know, have thoughts about what their institution has needed. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in on that front because it sounds like a lot of your drivers were operational in nature and, and ours is a little opposite in that it was actually security and our internal auditors kind of bringing up the fact that we didn't have a real good handle on assets that was a driver. So. For those you know here on the call today, I think it's tapping into um, the what you, what your organization is either struggling with or trying to solve. Um, like Bob was mentioning, how can the CMDB? How would that help this? Once you know what init key initiatives they're um, working for, the CMDB can help support those initiatives. I think you're better off to start right sizing your initiative based on those pieces. So. Um, we had the need to, <clears throat> we have a, a service called Certified Desktop for Cornell, and it's how we are able to see what laptops and, and desktops are out there. More from an asset management standpoint, initially is how they started, but it got into the CMDB space when we started, you know, needing to know uh, what's the current level of patching on these devices to see if they are meeting a certain level of security where we actually don't mind them being on the network. So tapping into the needs to um, understand from a security perspective how we're managing these devices and doing a good job with it, it's kind of how we started. So endpoints were the first CI types that we actually have as part of our program where they're pretty well managed, but well, where we're at today is we've got servers and a, a different repository over there. We've got a portfolio of applications that's in a different repository. So definitely in our organization, you know, looking forward to bringing those things into the same um, space so that we can really do dependency mapping. We're, we're now got disparate systems all over the place that are doing elements of this, but not really give us giving us that one pane of glass like Bob was saying. So. Um, 
to, back to the question is, you know, identifying what those business drivers are that you can help support, I think is key. Because if you try to take on the world and just start tracking everything and mapping all the dependencies, you end up with a lot of architects or, or technicians spending a lot of time trying to keep something up to date that they might not feel they're getting a lot of value out of. And so it's more, you end up working for the tool rather than the tool working for you. So in order to avoid that, I'd say, uh, Scope scope it right when, as you get started would be my suggestion. I'm, I'm going to steal that quote, by the way. I love that quote. You're working for the tool instead of tool working for you. That, that's great. That's a quotable. I, I took that from an article that I can't remember who exactly shared it, but it was one of our architects, and they were talking about CMDB. And that was how they felt about the implementation of it was that they were spending all their time working for the tool. So, you know, that, you know, that's where I actually got that from. And I won't say that the initiative wasn't successful. It was, but you do end up with, you know, some folks who it might not actually be making their job. Um, it's not, it might, might not be adding the value you assume it's going to bring. I was going to jump in there real quickly, and I'll try not to spend too much time on it, but um, I'll give you a quick story of how I explained how our original implementation of the CMDB occurred. Um, nobody spent the time to come up with the business needs or the drivers or the reasoning behind it. And there was a team that was tasked with going out to the rest of 800 people in an ITS organization to say, we're going to build a CMDB. Tell us what you want in it. And it was literally like going to a bunch of people and saying, we're building this automobile, tell us what you want. And then each team would say, oh, well, I need a four by four and I need leather interior and I needed to have heated seats and like the equivalent of the deluxe SUV. And the CMDB team would come back and say, mm, no, it's not gonna be quite that good, but um, we're gonna give you the midsize crossover tell us what you want in it. And the other team would come back and say, well, oh, but I don't really need a new vehicle anyway, so you didn't give me what I wanted the first time around, so what's the second one really gonna do? Well, just, it's gonna be the greatest thing ever. You're gonna want it, you're gonna need it, tell us what you want in it. And we did that, I swear, at least five different cycles with teams. This was not my project, but my project team that I was working with at the time was part of one of those teams being asked, what do you want in it? multiple flavors over and over again. And I finally had to go back to that project team and say, look, if you don't have use cases or reasoning or some sort of value add to explain to those teams, you're not gonna get anywhere with them. So what are we doing this for? And what is it really gonna provide the organization? Because otherwise, if you're just speaking to addressing specific points in time scenarios, most of those teams have tools already available. That they've been doing that work to begin with. So you really got to step it up the next level and explain to them really what we're solving by putting that thing in place. And if you can't do that, then you're not going to get anywhere and you might as well just scrap this project. That's a really, really good point. You can't let the CMDB just be a solution in search of a problem, right? So mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. That's yep. huge. Um, oh yeah, I see some, some exactly, amen. Yeah, what's in it for me? Absolutely, in the chat. So um, yeah, so don't miss out on that piece. So uh, I'm actually gonna move on to the next question here, um, unless anybody has like uh, burning things or other good stories they wanna share around this. I actually, I shouldn't stifle audience participation if there's anyone who wants to chime in here. Cool. Um, so I'm going to toss this next one to uh, to Lucas. Um, did you decide to use an external framework? So Mitch just mentioned uh, at the beginning there a couple of like framework model type type things uh, that could be used when initially building out. Did you decide to use an external framework for your CMDB, um, or did you go custom? Um, how has that how's that been in terms of impacting success? Thanks, Will. Uh, we're actually one of those in the uh, group with the rest. Most of the attendees that we're in the, the early stage in the planning phase. So 
it's what we're at now is is kind of a hybrid. We've looked at the caught it I, uh, business reference model, and I put a, a link in the chat for that framework. People we'll look into into that. So it's basically, you know, what what is higher ed doing from a business standpoint? Is instruction, research, outreach, and then mapping things in the CMDB to those um, elements within the within the business reference model. And from, a, from another hybrid perspective, we're looking, you know, starting out a little smaller, mapping service to service offering and relationships and going, going at that level. Our change management is still in um, its earlier years. We moved from um, like fighting fires to now doing a lot more standard change and, and at that level. And so part of what, what's driving our seem to be is, is looking at change impact. And, and another hybrid element of this was um, we had a homegrown desktop hardware asset system. And so we migrated to using assets uh, in Team Dynamics for that, that hardware, hardware management for the desktop support side. So I can't really speak to how our decisions impacted success other than having the assets in there has been much better than having it in their homegrown system. Um, so with that, I'm you know happy panelists, if you can speak to any of the frameworks that you've used for building out. And I do see someone in the chat mentioning, um, giving kind of a plus one to cut it. Bob, I think you also use that model, yeah? Yeah, we do from a business perspective, when it comes to like within the IT domain, we break down and do our own custom thing. Um, once we get deeper inside, like the specific services. Thoughts from anyone in the audience around this? I think that though, what um, both of you have kind of just highlighted is framework is framework, right? It's not something necessarily you want to adhere to 100%. It's a good starting place to kind of give you some ideas for the, the, the core elements that you're going to need. And then you'll obviously need to do some customization. So yeah, if I could chime in Great. on this one, because this was a stumper for me mm -hmm. a little bit is, you know, you go back to your organization and sometimes they're like, oh, well, you have ITIL certification. What we'll do what ITIL says. And they're like, what what does ITIL say our configuration item should be and what our attribute should be? And you just kind of shake your head because it's not, you know, it's that's a concept for how to approach it and maintain it and set up processes and tools and resources. But the level of granularity that you're going to be asked for if you kind of represent ITSM or ITIL on that on a project like this is you, you know, you might want you're gonna to want to use like ITSM, we're not we're tool agnostic and also sort of framework agnostic, but um, caught it and other um, frameworks like the common service um, data model that ServiceNow came out with and utilizing other things like that to tease out what your CI types really are needed for your organization and what fields you actually need on those records is not something that we can just you know show up and we don't already have like a book of what those things should be because even the number of endpoints with the internet of things that has been unleashed upon us has changed, you know, as soon as we would sit down and write, here's all the attributes that you're going to need and it would be out of date. Um, but I, I like that Bob had the, uh, the framework because as we're starting down this road, you know, that already happened where people are like, oh, well, can you give me a list of the CI types and what the attributes? I'm like, no, I don't have that, but we can work on it. A quick comment, another colleague, um, most of you know, um, and uh, her organization uses Obashi. Um, I can't attest to it, but I put the link in the chat. Cool. Great. So we've thought about business needs. We've thought about a framework. We started to build a model that we're gonna use. How are we getting the data into our system? Um, is this something we're going to do with discovery or is it manual entry or what, you know, and how are we coming to that? I think I want to start with Jen on this one. Um, yeah, how, how is your CMDB populated? 
Uh, we do not currently have a CDB, CMDB any longer. Okay. Um, much like Lucas was saying, we are now um, more focused on the asset management side. Mm -hmm. um, we do have processes in place. So there is a cab and that is a fairly um, healthy, mature process that has been there and has been successful to an extent. Um, I'll throw that out there as a caveat because I could give you a few scenarios where a CMDB probably would have saved us just countless amounts of hours. Um, but we've scaled back significantly, much because the original go round um, didn't have the same kind of buy in by the entire organization. And so the data quickly became stale in multiple departments and other departments kept it up to date, but it just didn't have the reliability and much of it was manual. So you're just not going to get the same type of interaction from teams. Um, but we do the asset management side of things and we have change records and we kind of marry up data between those two to, to kind of give us a, a replication of what we would be getting out of our CMDB. But I will say that I have actually quantified how many hours we could have saved had we had a complete and accurate CMDB back when we did a data center move about four years ago. Um, that data center move was painful to say the least. Yeah. yeah. And did require quite a few moments of sitting in a um, the equivalent of a war room with my network team, my infrastructure team, my services team, trying to um, capture the same information that we could have had and that was originally intended to be part of the CMDB but was no longer current and no longer up to date. So we all had to sit together in the room with our computers open. And I believe we quantified it out to be about 175 hours worth of just aggregating, collecting information to yeah. figure out what needed to happen with coordinating those services and making sure that that was a seamless transition for all of those end users that would have been impacted by those services now being shifted either to the cloud or having a lift and shift where we'd have to literally have a power outage or you know whatever that scenario was. That's, that's quite a bit of time to sit down with a group of people and take them away from other projects because now we have to sit together collectively and say, hey, Joe, I've got this IP address touching this thing. You know, What is it? What does it do? Which server does it belong to? Which services is it impacting? Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. <laughs> I'll jump in with some lessons about manual, I guess, because our CMDB is largely manually managed. Um, we have some automation with our servers and we're working on some automation with SCCM and JAMP, but um, for the most part, it's been a manual effort. And, you know, we, we definitely put some time and energy into putting in the things we thought we cared about. But I'd say we got some inspiration from KCS and I think Alicia made a con comment earlier about, um, you know, right sizing. And so our approach became more, hey, let's worry about it at the time when we need something. So if you're creating a ticket and you can't find an appropriate configuration item, that's the time to create it. If you're creating, you know, a change and you can't find the configuration item that you're changing in the CNDB, that's the time to create it. And so it became much more of an on-demand approach. And, you know, uh, we really empowered people to, if you see something wrong, fix it. You know, you don't, there's not some kind of uh, special uh, permission, I guess, you know, to, to correct an attribute of a configuration item that you, that you know is wrong. Inform the owner, hey, look, I saw this, it was wrong, but it became more collaborative in that way. Um, the other kind of thing we did early and still do today is we make extensive use of the good old other, right? So a lot of our things have options for choosing other. Like I couldn't find the thing I'm looking for. It's I, my time is too valuable to figure out what's wrong. Like I'm just going to pick other. And so we do a lot of auditing and quality control on those other selections and go back and look for patterns and identify gaps yeah. that way. So, you know, allowing some, hey, look, it, it doesn't really matter for the moment, but if we see a bunch, now we wanna do something about it. 
that, so the, actually that last part, we've been talking about auditing the other and uh, in general around this idea of there's gonna be some, some amount, even in a, in a good implementation uh, of manual effort, right? To, to keep this stuff up to date. Um, our next question was about roles and responsibilities um, within the org to manage manage the CMDB, manage the care and feeding. I like that phrase that you used, Mitch, uh, when we were talking about this. So, um, you know, do you have uh, specific folks set up to work on this? And I think actually we have some poll questions that are related here um, that maybe Mitch, you can kick yeah, out to the group. Absolutely. Um, I'm gonna throw this poll out there, give you about 30 seconds to respond. Uh, let me know if you can see this. And these are just on the fly polls. You may have some concerns with the questioning and the question and the wording, uh, just transparency. These are just kind of on the fly polls, uh, just to give us a rough idea. Yeah, so not a whole lot of staff allocation in general, <laughs> unsurprisingly. Cool. Although, uh, yeah, a couple of folks are saying more than 25 people. So I'm wondering if for them, that's the same idea of what sort of Bob was talking about, right? It's a sort of all in effort. Everybody is, is tasked with in some capacity maintenance. Yeah, I don't, you're right, Lauren. I don't have a zero as a choice. <laughs> yeah, and this is really kind of goes to the question of, you know, who is doing what, the roles and responsibilities. I think we, that's, we're touching on that um, point in question five, so. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I think we've got you know half more than half people responded. That's about a minute into it, so I'm going to go ahead and end the poll, and I'll share it. So, uh, 53 people um, say more less than five people. Um, Seven percent more than 25 people. Well, did you want me to do the other poll question? It seems to yeah, be sort of related. Yeah, let's do the second question okay. too, and yeah. Okay. Yeah, obviously, if you don't have a CMDB right now, then uh, it, the question is not super applicable, but. All right, so here we go. And again, we'll give about 30 to 45 seconds for this one. Feel like humming the Jeopardy tune as people are taking the poll. <laughs> yeah, not surprising. Centralized and distributed, right? Because it takes a takes a village. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty much uh, an even split between folks who are who are showing up as you know one team responsible versus multiple teams. I'll go ahead so. and share the results. Yeah. All right. Cool. Interesting. Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm sort of curious to know about um, for those centralized teams, who is the centralized team? Is it actually the, the, the ITSM office? Is it some other group? Is it like, is it security? Is it the service desk? Who's the kind of in charge of, of managing this stuff? But maybe people can drop some of those spec specifics in the chat. Um, yeah, app admins. So, um, so yeah, back to this idea of roles and responsibilities. Um, I mean, Alicia, I know that you, you and I have worked a little bit on like planning some of this stuff out. Um, Jen, yours is not really functional at the moment. Lucas, I don't know, is it, is it kind of you and your office managing everything? At this point, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, in past organizations, though, our CMDB was um, it was very integrated with our processes, and so every team had a responsibility for maintaining some sort of uh, reliability of the information and being populated in there. Um, but we also had I actually played the role of release manager 
for that particular organization because we had global teams that had their own um, systems and code repositories and branches of the codes. And so there was a lot of, um, I wouldn't say I was controlling it, but a little bit of a coach and making sure that folks were putting in things and meeting those standards and trying to be timely and any updates if it was sort of after the fact, because sometimes the, the urgency was more important than the data itself. So, um, but it was a shared responsibility. You want to empower those teams that are directly in the day-to-day -to, -day to have some sort of say and involvement in it. And to Jen, Jen's point, because um, it's funny, because sometimes you're, you're, uh, or your current organizational maturity where you happen to find yourself isn't always the breadth of knowledge you have when you're an ITSM person. Sometimes you're sort of, you know, it's, it's just calling out. So previously in a, another position that I held within service management, what worked really well to keep the CMDB up to date was it was tied into all of the uh, sub procedures all across the organization for doing the things. It was just kind of baked in. So if someone was getting a new um, uh, corporate uh, cell phone, you know, as part of setting that phone up before we shipped it out to them, it was adding it to their inventory so that, you know, at some point they called the service desk and or there was an issue with it, or we had to wipe the phone if it got stolen or, um, or lock it out for a security reason, or if they got terminated, that we had record of that. And it was, you know, linked to the customer record. Same for adding laptops. And so I think the success of maintaining this is, is how, um, you know, from the beginning, can you can you scope this into um, the other initiatives and work those in as a task as part of the existing processes that teams already have? Cool. Um, great. Thanks for your thoughts on that, guys. Um, just in the interest of time, I want to kind of move us along. Um, and I'm going to skip the, the number six question. Um, but I think that actually the last question here kind of ties back to one of the questions we had from uh, earlier in the chat. So I want to say to everybody here, um, what have been the biggest benefits you've drawn or hope to draw from, from your CMDB implementation? Um, so like, what is the, what is the value add? What, what have you gotten out of this that you've really been excited about getting out of it? Maybe Bob, you have like a, a big win. Sure. Um, I think the biggest wins have been um, the folks that uh, the, it's kind of the Hawthorne effect from a change management perspective of forcing people to think through what am I touching and what does it touch that could break if what I've done is, um, you know, goes wrong, or something goes off yeah. the rails. And um, that discipline, I think, has really helped a lot of our folks that participate, you know, actively in the change management uh, process for, for helping them, like, have that moment of, oh yeah, I got to pick something. What am I changing? What is the potential risk and impact to this? So um, it's it's kind of a hidden benefit because I think if you took it away now, they probably would continue those practices without a reliable CMDB, but by having it and having it part of that process, um, it enabled them to really get that discipline, um, you know, part of their just everyday approach. Um, the second thing I would note from big value standpoint for us has been uh, as we do service reviews, which is something that's fairly new for us, we start collecting all of the ticketing related data uh, for all the assets that come together to make up any one of our services. And in doing that, we've really been able to open people's eyes as at least in our environment, we might have a configuration item, you know, that's owned by this team or this person over here and another one owned by somebody else over here. And they may not actually work together very often or really 
you know, inter interact that often, but yet their two components are working together to deliver service value. And putting the data in one place and looking at it together and bringing those folks together, they start to understand, you know, how their particular component influences and affects the performance of others. And, and doing that through having some relationships and so forth is really, uh, I think, elevated our maturity as, as we think about things from a service perspective. I can be quick on this one. So I'll share a realized benefit um, from a previous job and then our like largest hopes currently at, at Cornell as to what the CMDB will do for us. So um, what I really liked about uh, having the CMDB, uh, a fully implemented one was the proactive maintenance you could have. So we started getting tickets for a particular piece of hardware. And I can't remember whether it was people's landline telephones or if it was their network connection. But getting all these incidents from individual customers, we realized it was because it, they all, were all relying on this same piece of, um, the same hardware component had gone, was going bad. On a, on a schedule. So what we were able to do was go out and replace that everywhere it was. So that kept tickets from coming in. So the, you know, the best incident is the one you never get. In this case, you know, we could predict that well in the month that that's going to fail. And then any, that person at their office is going to be out of, they're not going to be able to work. Um, they're going to be out of luck. Uh, so that's the biggest benefit that I, I really remember uh, pulling from that's really cool that you can do that you can kind of seek out and, and and get to swapping something out before it fails um, which is really cool um, at Cornell the, the big driver as to why we're uh, starting out on this journey and it's going to be a three-year journey we know that is to enable a, a safe access project that we have I think similar to something Stanford did around passwordless authentication. So to, is really the backbone of realizing that goal and larger dream, um, we need, we have to have this in place because we need to know what we have, who has what devices in order to use the combination of um, uh, certificates and device information to authenticate someone based on who they are and, and their device um, rather than a password. So I don't know where, because ticketing systems don't always come with great CMDB, um, you know, they're kind of ticketing system first and maybe CMDB second. I don't know where our security team will land as far as what ends up being the approved um, CMDB tool that we use. And uh, that's part of the challenge and, and why we were, Will and I, interested in having this panel because you really need to know the business drivers even before you do tool selection around what you're going to use for your CMDB because uh, your tool maturity might, you know, enable or, or keep you, hold you back from certain key initiatives. Yeah, really good point. Um, Lewis or Jen or anybody in the audience, anything to add? I did see... Um, one note, just like a small uh, uh, a note from Erica uh, uh, that they're using there is to identify gaps with service continuity planning. So that's good, it's sort of a, and, and a well, proactive approach. So uh, I, think, yeah. I think Alicia, like she touched on a really key point that is helpful in explaining the value of the CMDB when you go out and talk to people. There's, there's two different pieces of it. And one is proactive. Like you want to assess potential impacts and try to avoid those incidents before they even start coming in. Most of the time when folks are meeting with um, the technical teams, they're looking at it more from the reactive side in terms of being able to like triage and look up where everything was the point of failure, where were the issues resolved and everything. And I think that's a little bit harder of a sell for technical people because they often have a large amount of tools at their beck and call anyway. So in their mind, they have everything that they need to be able to respond to those incidents. You really wanna try and avoid the incidents though. <laughs> like just said, it's like, so the real big bang there is in trying to do that assessment and planning before you make those changes. 
And I think there's a lot of opportunity, you know, as a project manager and a former service manager, you know, there's an opportunity for us to make sure that large scale things that are going to be going out, that we're staffed accordingly so that we don't get hit by just this massive amount of tickets coming in, just potentially not even an incident, just questions and aftermath of just rolling out a big initiative. And, um, it allows us to have, you know, maybe buddy up with another team to say, hey, we've got this big thing rolling out. Could you come in and help kind of augment the team for a short period of time so that we can handle the influx of calls? Um, it's just a better experience all around for the end users and you wanna be able to do that for them whenever you can. Excellent, excellent points. Great, well, uh, we've got just a couple of minutes left. So I know there are a couple of questions in the chat that have already been answered, but um, we have a couple of extra things to, to ask. So um, Deb asked if someone could share at some point what iterations they went through or questions they found relevant, um, helping narrow down um, scoping, qualifying business requirements that the CMDB would provide. So, to say again, uh, were there any specific questions asked or what kind of iteration process did you go through as designing and developing the CMDB? I guess we uh, kind of start, I, I was waiting for someone with a more mature program to <laughs> chime in, but I'll do it. Um, so, cause we're doing this sort of right now is we're tracking a lot of things all over the place. And so first, just starting with what are we already tracking? Where is it? You know, and, and in using my ITSM hat, what do I call that as far as a CI type? You know, rather than, because at some point we'll be giving our definitions, but I'm also formulating them at the same time. So really finding out what's already getting tracked and, and where so that you can start to, to kind of think about how to include the already track stuff as in scope. And um, then really to iterate on, uh, we'll probably use Caudit or some other framework to tease out then, okay, if these are our CI types, let's iterate on what the attribute should be and go um, like to the server team and talk about just server as a, a you know, what, what pieces do they already track in, SF info is our internal tool for this. What fields are already there that maybe we would pull then into the CMDB? Um, and really going after uh, probably service delivery managers to approach um, what we have is a portfolio of services and related products. And we've got a disaster recovery tab that loosely will say it's dependent on this and that and this and that, but nothing specifically. Like it won't give the actual server name, but it'll be like the telephone server or something like that. So I think starting out refining the information that we already have to get it to a level of quality will take enough time. <laughs> and then once people have good examples, it's a lot easier for them to, oh, you, you need CI, a CI type and fields for that. What does that mean? Then you'd say, well, go look at the one for a server. And then it's like, oh, okay, yeah, for, well, for a telephone, it would be this, this, and this. Um, but pretty much working with our service delivery managers in-house for whatever CI types they're kind of the expert of um, will be where I would, where I plan to scope working those details out. Okay, oh, we have some last minute questions popping in here. Um, there was a question about retooling uh, did anyone retool their CM process to incorporate CMDB? I feel like I heard someone or maybe a couple of our uh, panelists talking about utilizing um, change, at least trying to use the, the CMDB for a proactive standpoint with change. Um, did, was the question about like um, using change as a process to update the CMDB? It could be both. Both bidirectional. Did, did they proactively use the change management to push updates to the CMDB, mm -hmm. or 
did they have an existing site like our service link based service now based change management process uh did anybody retool that to then raise changes against CIs now that they had them in a C CMDB where in a prior iteration, like right now we raise it against services. So uh, we're, we're probably gonna retool the process eventually to be able to raise the change against the CI item itself. So did anybody do have any experience with that kind of stuff? I can take that offline if anybody's interested also. I, you know. Well, I think this one should go to our facilitator. Uh, Will is also our change manager at Cornell. So are we going to retool the process? Um, I think <laughs> CI is just there, right? So we just start yeah. leveraging the fact that we now have that. Yeah, I mean, it's a clear, it's a clear piece that I want integrated into the change um, process that we're not really using right now uh, because of the limited amount of data that we have in the CMDB. Uh, I was like, Will, obviously you, the, I was going to say, sounds like, Will, you need to join uh, Chris and I on this other effort is the uh, the series of webinars that we're giving about DevOps and change enablement. So uh, sounds like we yeah, just recruited somebody, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> um, we are, well. not to cut people off, we're, we're really one minute before the hour. So I want to be yeah. conscientious yeah. of people's time. This is really good discussion. I appreciate all the comments, feedback, questions. Uh, we did have an idea just pop up. Um, if any of you who are more mature in the space would be willing to share artifacts, uh, documents, templates, anything that you use that you could, you know, uh, have us benefit from, please uh, send it um, to me, uh, mpouts, so M-P-A-U-T-Z, um, at usc.edu, and I will make it part of the recording. Uh, we'd love to, to get that input. Um, thank you again for attending the uh, webinar, the event. Uh, be sure to mark your calendars for the second part of the ITIL Change Management DevOps series happening on March 9th. Keep an eye out in your inbox for more information next couple of weeks. Um, again, this session is being recorded. It'll be available within five business days on the ITSM website. Thanks, Will, Cornell, the rest of you, Bob, uh, everyone um, for participating. And everyone have a nice day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now. Thanks, Thanks for having Thanks, us. Mitch. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care.